Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's just after 11 o'clock central time here, so we're going to get started. My name is Michelle Massey, and I am the Director of Public Programs at the Museum of Russian Art. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this fun virtual opening. Now, normally we'd be having a big party in the galleries to celebrate such a transformation at the museum. But because of these times, we thought that this might be a really wonderful way to sum up not just one opening, not just two, essentially three new exhibitions in three weeks, not to forget that we also opened another exhibition, uh, Marlena Miles, at the end of January. You know, with COVID and everything going on and various closures, that changes the schedules and we've all had to be very flexible and, and work strongly as a team. And I'm really proud to work with this team of wonderful colleagues and uh, really, truly experts. Uh, so when you stack these openings all together, it really is a remarkable rem amount of work that goes into unveiling such a transformation. So we're excited to show you what we have in the galleries today and talk a little bit about what this spring is going to look like. Now, the galleries are open for viewing. We're welcome, we welcome all of you to come and join us. Uh, we take the safety of our staff, volunteers and visitors very seriously. But of course, you know, some of you are staying at home safely and that's wonderful. And some of you are not local to Minneapolis. So we're happy to bring you not only this event today, but future events coming up, uh, more virtual tours with artists and our curator as well. So today, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll be hearing from our director and from our chief curator uh, and a little bit more of myself as well, I'm sure. Uh, and we will have the opportunity to share what's happening in the galleries, um, how this works with our mission, how you can support the Museum of Russian Art, and you can always ask questions. You can use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. They'll only be viewable by myself, uh, Mark, and Masha, uh, so feel free. We'll try to answer your questions as we go, but we will certainly save time at the end. We're slated to go an hour today. Uh, this will be a really casual conversation. We're, we're sitting here in our offices today, uh, so you can really get to know us as well. It's our pleasure to be with you. So with that, I would like to first welcome our wonderful director. We are so lucky to have him and work with him. Please welcome Mark Meister. Thank you, Michelle, and welcome everyone. I want to second everything that Michelle said about all of the work that took place to make these exhibitions possible during this very, very brief transition time. You know, it's a thrill to have our galleries full after the transition month of February. And I'm happy to just give you a brief introduction and then I'm going to pass it on to Masha. So, in the past, our visitors often asked us if we had a permanent collection. And in fact, we do, and it's been growing by leaps and bounds, and we now have about 7,000 items. So we thought it was about time that we have a permanent collection gallery. And so that's what I'm going to start with. It's on the lower level of the museum, and it's the first permanent collection gallery in the museum's history. It's going to rotate, so works of art will come in and out. And while right now it's primarily paintings with one sculpture, in the future it will have prints, posters, photographs, decorative arts, uh, minor arts, all of the things that we feature in the museum's collection. And we're going to be highlighting new acquisitions. So we know, because it's been open for a couple of weeks now, that this gallery has immediately become a favorite with the public. Then moving up to the first floor in our main gallery, we have Ekaterina Kroman, The Art of Synergism. And this highlights the museum's uh, commitment to exhibiting the work of Russian emigre artists, those living in Minnesota and elsewhere. Katerina happens to live in the Catskills in New York State. And this exhibition you'll find uh, showcases the unique technique of Chromine's work, which uh, is something that I certainly have never seen before, and I suspect you haven't either. Then moving up to our mezzanine, we have paintings by Geli Korzhev, Soviet idealist and iconoclast. Now, many of you are familiar with Korzhev's work. He's a very, very prominent 
uh, Soviet and post-Soviet era artist, you may be surprised to find out through the exhibition that he actually decried the dissolution of the Soviet Union and feared for the future of the new Russia. And then as Michelle mentioned, we had an exhibition in the galleries since March, Marlena Miles, The Dynamics of Russian Imperialism in Alaska. And that was something that we brought to the museum with a Minnesota State Arts Board Cultural Community Partnership Grant that's designed for institutions like ours to work with in, in uh, people of color and indigenous peoples in uh, Minnesota. And so this is a Native American's reflections on the interactions of the indigenous peoples of Alaska and Russians in the 18th and 19th century of Russian America. It's a period that most people don't know much about and we're happy to bring this to you. It's a very, very interesting and compelling exhibition. So with that brief introduction, I'm going to bring Masha forward, our chief curator, Masha Zavialvo. She comes. <clears throat> oh, I'm here. So welcome everyone to our opening. It's indeed a very unusual opening for me uh, since um, I'm used to having crowds of people seeing friends and our members, our wonderful volunteers and docents, of course our staff. Uh, but it's different today. So today I'm going to take you through the museum and we will go from one gallery to another uh, and we will look at our new exhibitions uh, virtually. There will be no mixing with people, no socializing, but a lot more information that you would usually get at our openings. And we will look uh, closer at just a few things from, from each gallery. And with this, uh, let me start sharing my screen so that we can uh, go into our museum. So let me do it like this. Um, and now the next step usually, and we are learning to be uh, experts in Zoom, we will go to uh, full screen. And now we are in the Museum of Russian Art on March 2nd, uh, 2021. And this photo was taken literally 15 minutes ago. This is how our museum looks uh, right now. And uh, here we are in the main gallery, but let's uh, start uh, as you often hear on the phone in the order it was received. So we will start with the exhibition that opened first. And this is uh, our fireside gallery. You see it's, uh, it opened on January 23rd and um, very soon after we reopened after the second closure uh, due to COVID. And this was uh, wonderful to have uh, the museum open with this exhibition of our local uh, Native American artist, Marlena Miles. And Mark talked about this exhibition a little bit. We had a very uh, interesting event with Marlena when she talked about both this exhibition and her art and herself. It's all digital art. You can see here uh, one of the paintings, uh, works actually that we have in the exhibition. And you see the medium says vector illustration, print on metal, beautiful colors. And what's wonderful about this art, it's very reproducible. It is uh, because that's how it was created on screen. So it is as good on screen as it is in the gallery. Uh, so here we have some of the paintings. This wonderful painting is the mystery of the lost uh, Chirikov ship. So one of the Russian vessels uh, going to explore the Alaskan coast uh, was lost. And all the stories are 
in this exhibition. Uh, the exhibition, let's go back to this painting, closes on March 14th. So we have a few days, almost two weeks uh, to see that show. And now let's go down to the lower gallery. So the lower gallery from now on will be dedicated to our permanent collection. It does not mean that everything here will be on permanent display. These are two different things. So we're going to rotate the art, except probably for this painting because it's so large. It's uh, what, 14 feet long, uh, about, about that size that it, it won't fit into any of the storage that we have available. And uh, so it might stay permanently on display, but really it makes the room. Uh, with its uh, beautiful colors, a painting by Mikhail Khmilkov, uh, uh, Mazalan greets uh, the hero, Khrushchev greets Yuri Gagarin after his flight into outer space. And uh, this is what this exhibition will be dedicated to, ex exhibiting art from our permanent <coughs> collection. We are going to rotate about uh, once a year uh, we are going to show more of our three-dimensional objects, probably some of our folk art, some sculpture, more non-conformist art. Uh, but at this time, most of these paintings, 12, actually moved down from the main and mezzanine gallery to here. Uh, these are the paintings that uh, <clears throat> that we showed in our Leaders and the Masses exhibition. Uh, this is our recent donation from uh, 19 and early 20 from uh, the Rose Brady and Yuri Manichuk collection. And if Rose is watching this presentation, I just want to express my uh, sincere gratitude to her for donating over 100 paintings uh, to our museum. And uh, this uh, exhibition and our permanent collection here in the lower gallery is also our way of saying thank you to all the donors that gave their art to our museum, because this is how our collection grows. We don't buy art. We receive donations uh, that we have enough of to keep our collection growing on a literally monthly basis every month some new wonderful donations arrive uh, to our museum. And uh, here, uh, these three paintings are in the gallery uh, downstairs. They are not part of the Rose Brady and Yuri Manichuk donation. These are some of the oldest paintings that the museum had from 2002 and three and or when the museum was still not in that building, uh, some, of these, uh, some of these works that are on display, not necessarily these, but these are some of the earliest paintings that we had uh, given to us by our founder, Ray Johnson, from the collection of Raymond and Susan Johnson, the collection of Russian art. And we are very grateful uh, to our founder for uh, establishing this museum, choosing this uh, beautiful facility that uh, we still enjoy a lot, as well as our visitors, and uh, laying the foundation to our collection. So here you can see two paintings by Kondratyuk, and one to the right is another Geli Korja, and we will see more of these wonderful artists uh, as we move through the museum and through these exhibitions that we just opened. Uh, an interesting and fascinating feature of this permanent collections gallery, which we are going to rotate every year, is the new acquisitions uh, section that we are going to rotate actually every month. Every month uh, you will go downstairs in the lower gallery and you will see uh, something new. Uh, so this painting by Andrei Lysenko, a prominent Soviet artist, uh, was donated to us uh, recently, uh, at the, just uh, a few months ago. And we are really grateful to the donor uh, for, for this donation. 
uh, I'm not sure. Sometimes our donors wish to re uh, remain anonymous. And uh, so sometimes I will be mentioning the names of our donors. And sometimes I will be just thinking uh, those who contributed and shared their art with the Minnesota public. Um, it's not just the Soviet art that you will see in the lower gallery. Uh, there are a few pieces on display from other kinds of donations, and this piece by Alexander Gajur, a nonconformist Soviet artist, uh, was given to us by the Kola Foundation and initially by Yuri and Nelly Traceman. Um, we received uh, about 50 nonconformist uh, works and also some sculpture as well in this collection. We showed this piece before. It's fairly large and very fascinating. You can see here these little pilgrims traveling through the imaginary landscapes of uh, human mind, I believe, or, and human history. And before we move to the main gallery, I would like to go back a couple months, just a month, uh, uh, a month and a half ago when we deinstalled the previous collection. And I want to show you a short video on how we deinstalled these large paintings. And you can see this painting, uh, Motherland Greets the Hero, Khrushchev meeting Gagarin, going down from the uh, from the mezzanine gallery to the main gallery. And after that, the painting is so large that we had to uh, take the painting out through the main entrance and through the street and uh, into the loading dock, through the collection storage and into the lower gallery where you can see it now. So the painting actually took quite a journey. First, uh, you see we had to use the lift uh, to move the painting down from the mezzanine gallery. And we have quite a wonderful team of installers. You can see my adults, uh, our collections assistant, our intern, um, Lydia, then Mark Pierce, and Andrew, who is uh, our uh, installation assistant during installations. He does not work permanently for the museum. And also Jeannie Tyson, uh, somewhere here in the gallery, our installation specialist. Um, so you see now the painting is off the lift and it's entirely in the hands of our installers. Uh, so the safety and security and well-being of the painting uh, which you can see how large it is, is in the hands of uh, our wonderful expert installation team. So now the task is to move the painting, uh, make it horizontal again. And it's not easy because we have to be extremely careful about these paintings. It's stretched canvas. So anytime you touch or poke the canvas, the, uh, there is a trace remaining that might start developing into cracks or craculure or dragon skin cracks or some other kinds of many, many kinds of uh, damage that the painting can experience. So I want to show you the entire, path, uh, the entire uh, video clip because I just enjoyed the very last few seconds of it when we will see the painting moving uh, in front of the screen, in front of the camera and careful, careful. And uh, we will enter this painting as it moves uh, past the screen and past our eyes. eyes. So now the task, the next thing, you see it's kind of warping, which is not good, but it was just a couple seconds, uh, or which is great. And now we are, we are going to say goodbye to this painting 
in on the mezzanine gallery, but it is going into the lower gallery where it will be permanently displayed. So I hope you enjoyed this um, little video clip. And now we are moving into the exhibition that opened recently. Uh, on February 20th, uh, it's called Ekaterina Chromian, The Art of Synergism. And this is one of the two exhibitions that replaced our leaders and the masses. And uh, this exhibition uh, is of uh, a Russian American artist, Ekaterina Chromian. So let's look at this red painting first. So Ekaterina Kromian uh, comes from St. Petersburg, the same, uh, it's my native city. Uh, she grew up there, she received her education in uh, the Rapin Art Institute affiliated with the Academy of Arts. And this is one of the finest art uh, uh, educational establishments in Russia now and was in, in the Soviet Union, the former Imperial Academy of Arts established by uh, in the time of um, actually Elizabeth and then Catherine the Great. Um, she calls her art the art of synergism and the, this unusual textural, very textural quality of this art uh, comes from uh, what Ekaterina does for, for a living. She is an art conservator and a full-blown professional artist. So uh, you can see, especially if you look at this painting, how textured uh, the surface is. So this uh, technique, this approach to creating art was developed by Ekaterina together with her husband, Victor, uh, who um, passed away a few years ago. And it was actually Victor who began to experiment with the backgrounds, with the surfaces. Uh, he uh, wanted to paint with, uh, well, he painted with uh, a lot of, using a lot of paint. Sometimes he would add marble dust or some other things into his paint to make it more uh, three-dimensional, more textured. And then he came, uh, more, the more he developed this, um, you know, sense of combining the three-dimensional relief and the flat two-dimensional visual art, such as painting, the more he, I guess, wanted to bring a third ingredient into the mix. And uh, he began to uh, make uh, collages. The collage, uh, what you can see here actually as the background, is the imprint of a collage of found objects. Um, so uh, Victor and Ekaterina, who uh, also helped him and was involved in the process of creating this new style that they call synergism. Um, so first they would put together a collage and then uh, pour, uh, first it was plaster, then resin over it, or put it into, encase it in, in this soft material that would leave the imprint of the collage on that mold, and then remove the found objects. So when you look at Ekaterina's paintings, you don't see the actual uh, found objects here. These are just the imprints, the print of a collage. And then it's not the end. Then, so a mold, a sort of a matrix is created. And then um, the artists put uh, another kind of material into the mold. Uh, it's, uh, it's not liquid, you cannot pour it, but it's soft enough to be pushed into every single corner and nook and cranny of this very intricate mold left from the imprint of the collage. And Ekaterina uses a, a special uh, paper pulp 
uh, composite. It's uh, her own her own recipe, her own ingredients, her own professional secret. And as the mold dries, then uh, or the filling in the mold dries out. After that, it's taken out, and this is the surface on which the artist paints. Ekaterina paints with acrylic paints. Uh, as you can see, she likes uh, metal paints. Uh, she also uses sprays, spray paint, almost like a street artist. Uh, she has become um, once on her own uh, without Victor uh, to collaborate and to work with her. Uh, she began to move in her own direction using more spray paint, uh, more metallic paint, um, becoming more of a, a very contemporary modernist uh, artist. So let's look at, uh, well, let's look at this painting closely. So what kind of objects does Ekaterina use? You can see here a lot of gloves and baseball gloves. You can see baskets, you can see some straps and belts and buckles, uh, gloves again, little bags and purses, and uh, imprints of shoes actually, uh, sneakers and uh, wire or cords, I would rather say, and um, buttons, uh, screws sometimes. Well, you can see a lot of imprints of screws because uh, that's how the objects are attached to uh, when the collage is created. So these are not actual, actual screws, they're, they're imprints of screws. But sometimes uh, Ekaterina, and recently she began to more and more uh, highlight the uh, unusual textures of these materials and creating a different kind of feel. Like we know that these gloves and these bags and belts are leather and she would try to cross over into a relief that would be cast from metal so creating this uh, impression of a metal metal casting while in fact what we look at is soft it's quite a soft material it's dry paper pulp and uh, this is how ex uh, her exhibition looks. And if you go into the gallery, you will also be able to see the actual mold. So what's lying on the floor here in front of us is the mold made of uh, silicone resin that uh, Ekaterina generously shared with our museum just to show uh, what kind of, um, a process is involved and uh, just to uh, make it visual, make it possible for our visitors to visualize a little bit how these, paint, these uh, paintings, these works of art are made. They're not quite paintings. They, they are a combination, a crossover and intersection of three different mediums actually. Uh, collage of found objects, the relief, the resulting uh, uh, bar relief, which in French means low relief. It's a three-dimensional art. It's it's a kind of a sculpture, even though it's flat, but uh, seems flat, but it's raised. And painting. Uh, these works are quite powerful because they are a combination. They're not just one medium, they're three in one. And they create an amazing, fascinating kind of energy in the exhibition. So this is one of those shows that you have to see in person uh, to be able to appreciate this art. And uh, here I just put these three images together to show that uh, quite often the artist paints on the same kind of surfaces. You can recognize these are the same uh, cast, the same print from the same, uh, uh, from the same um, design, I would say, but they are painted differently. And some, uh, some of these images you can see uh, what interests me and what I would like you to think about when you 
walk through the gallery and look at your art is the way these three different kinds of art, three different mediums interact with each other. So sometimes uh, we can see that uh, the painting medium overwhelms the collage and the sculpture, but sometimes it's different. Sometimes it's just one color, the uh, monochromatic harmonies of one uh, kind of color. So you can see a lot of beautiful reds and that's what also amazes me about these paintings is the, the variety of color within the same tone within the general definition of red. And here we can talk and think about how our color, words for colors are actually cultural constructs. There is no such thing as red. There are many, many reds and many, many colors that exist in real life. And this painting uh, focusing on the sculpture kind of disregarded, well, you can still see how sculptural the surface is, but focusing on the relief, on the three-dimensional quality of the raised uh, textural surface of these beautiful works. And this is how uh, we decided to install them. I actually worked with Ekaterina's art in Miami. I curated her show in the Museum of Contemporary Art in North Miami. Uh, which was uh, a great pleasure. Ekaterina is really a lot of fun to work with. And the staff of the MOCA in North Miami, the Museum of Contemporary Art was uh, just a wonderful, wonderful museum staff. I enjoyed every moment of that installation and the events that followed, uh, followed the installation. So in Miami, uh, I decided to hang four of her paintings, created, creating some kind of a cube that floats above the ground. Uh, but those were vertical paintings with this uh, horizontal in Miami. So here, and I should say that the exhibition in Miami happened in 16, early 17. Most of our paintings that we show here have been painted since that time. So a lot of these paintings are from 19 and from 2020. So Ekaterina is a very productive artist. She just works day and night. I think that's what she does. And so here you can see, I just took these two images uh, now last week, I believe to show you how uh, we installed these four paintings, decided not to hang them on the wall. They are the same relief, the same surface, and you can walk around and enjoy how the different lighting, we actually lit them differently. Some of them, are uh, the lighting is frontal. Uh, on some of them, the lighting is uh, slanted sideways um, at an angle to emphasize the, uh, to get more shadow out of the relief and to emphasize the textural quality of the painting. So as you walk around this installation, you will see how uh, the same relief painted differently, lit differently, creates a, a different, not just impression, but also a different feel and a different atmosphere and a different uh, mood about them. Um, So there are these four different surfaces. Each of the paintings have uh, uh, has a different title. And there is a little bit of a story here on the pedestal. So it's really a very fascinating piece. So now it's, it became one piece of art made of four large uh, canvases because they are actually canvases because they are mounted on canvas. So the imprints of the reliefs are mounted on canvas. Uh, that you can see that they are all different, take, uh, taken from different angles. And here is another very short movie. <laughs> I just, I like to catch some of the um, moments in the installation. This is how we install. They're quite heavy because of the, the frames are heavy and just the sheer size of the painting 
makes them heavy. And you see, they th this is just half of the installation, the two paintings combined. And our installers actually, Chini came up with the idea, idea to use the um, the hardware, the mounts that they use to hang doors. So it's just like the uh, mounts, the hardware that is you can find in every house. That's how we mount doors. Mm -hmm. uh, so I encourage you to look at um, Ekaterina's work in person. Uh, it is, uh, I believe we have 23 works by her. There are some smaller works that come from uh, some of her uh, early 2000s. I think the earliest is 2004, smaller works before she began to paint on uh, relief, to create these um, painted uh, complex uh, works that combines three kinds of medium. And uh, so there are about, uh, there are 23 works in that exhibition in the main gallery. And on the mezzanine, uh, we have works by Gelly Korzhev, about 30 of them between 29 and 30. Don't remember exactly, but I think there should be 30 of them. Paintings by Gelly Korzhev. We showed his art many times and invariably every time we show Gelly Korzhev's paintings, uh, we have great response. The first time we showed, we had an exhibition of uh, Korzhev's work was in 2007, even though occasionally uh, every once in a while we would show one or two or three of his paintings, but in 2007, the Museum of Russian Art mounted a solo exhibition of Gelly Korzhev. It was a grand event. At that time, we could borrow paintings from Russia and uh, many, many of his wonderful works came from the Tretikov Gallery in Moscow and the State Russian Museum in St. Petersburg, so two major museums of Russian art. And the exhibition uh, was awarded with the title of the Exhibition of the Year for Minneapolis at that time. Uh, it was really, really uh, an unforgettable show and a lot of people who saw it still remember it. So this time we, uh, took, uh, there are no paintings that can come from Russia now because there is some kind of a cultural embargo on cultural exchanges with the uh, state museums of Russia, which is still most of the museums are on a state on a governmental budget and uh, state controlled. So we have no paintings are or have <clears throat> been coming from Russia for many, many years already. I think almost eight years the embargo has been in place. Uh, but uh, fortunately, people collect art uh, from across the borders everywhere and always. Whenever, wherever you go to any country, be it China or India or Switzerland or Germany or uh, Mexico, there will be collectors who are interested in the art of other cultures. And uh, uh, here in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, we have uh, Ray Johnson, the founder of, of our museum. He, who actually began to collect Gelly Korshev, he knew him personally, often visited him in, uh, this, in his studio. So every time Ray would travel to Russia, he would visit Korzhev's uh, studio. They actually became friends and Ray's collection of Korzhev's, uh, even though it's kind of moving around a little bit, but it's still a wonderful collection. And uh, let's look at what we have on the mezzanine and talk about a very different kind of art, which is uh, 
Soviet, Soviet realist art. Uh, Gelly Korshev was born in 12, in 1925 and passed away in 2012. Uh, he was a prominent Soviet artist, one of the leading, I would say probably one of the top uh, five or six leading Soviet artists of the post-war era. A really a wonderful, wonderful uh, realist artist. Uh, he was born to, into the family of an architect and a teacher of Russian literature. And he went to all the best schools of the country. At that time, he went to the intermediary art school. That's where uh, he was when the war started in 1941. He stayed in Moscow for the first several months of the war of the germ of the Nazi invasion into the Soviet Union. And then his school was evacuated to a hundred miles east of Moscow to Bashkiria, to a small village where he spent two years. And the theme of war has become very important for him. Uh, in the, uh, so after he graduated from the uh, arts high, he went to the Surikov Art Institute and uh, graduated from the Surikov in 1950 and uh, became uh, a member of the Soviet Artist Union. He was at one point, uh, began to exhibit his works uh, actively and began to pay, became a professional artist. Uh, he had a studio in Moscow. At one point he was the head or the chair man, chairman of the Soviet Artists Union of the Russian Federation, not the entire Soviet Union. So Soviet Artists Union was one organization, but it was hierarchical. So there was the Soviet Artists Union of the USSR that uh, was, uh, that combined all the 15 re union uh, republics. And then each of the 15 Soviet republics had their own uh, artist unions. They were all, it was basically one organization. So it was a one hierarchical uh, organization with many branches. Uh, so Korzhev was the chairman of the artist union of the Russian Federation. And the Russian Federation was one of the 15 Soviet republics at that time. I know it's kind of difficult to figure out uh, how the Soviet Union was structured. Sometimes Russia is uh, um, believed to be the Soviet Union, but that's not true. So the Soviet Union was made of the 15 republics. And also Geli Korzhev was the a deputy of the um, Supreme Council Soviet of the Russian Federation. So he was an elected representative in what was believed to be an equivalent of the Soviet parliament, uh, even though uh, having a one party system precluded the Soviet parliament from being a truly democratic body as we know. And uh, so he was an important fun functionary, but he also was a believer, a true believer in the Soviet ideals of how a society should run and should be managed and should be structured. Uh, it does not mean that he was the sub active supporter of the actual Soviet Union as it was lived by the administrative structures as it was uh, in actual life. Uh, that's why we can see how his idealism, uh, Soviet idealism is reflected in his art. Uh, we see on the one hand, a lot of images of the just common Soviet people, the way they live their life in their clothing, in 
with the facial expressions that never express this enthusiasm and happiness and hope for the bright future of communism. We don't see these kinds of paintings, uh, these kinds of images in Korzhev's art. Um, and this is uh, a good example of this painting. It's an early painting from the 1950s. Uh, another painting kind of similar to that. Uh, it's a small sketch art actually, but beautifully executed from the 1950s. And slowly Korzhev begins to move away from this very smooth, realist style with small brush strokes and begins to create his own approach to a realist painting. And here you can see uh, his painting from the uh, 70s, uh, from the 1970s. It's called uh, the After, Before a Long Journey. And uh, it is a painting, yeah, it's from the 1970s. Believed to be a, a modeled on his daughter. Uh, so the sitter, the model for this painting was his daughter. Gilly Korzhev has had two daughters uh, that survived. They're still around and living in Moscow. And uh, so this painting, before a long journey shown, shows a young woman, a girl actually, probably 17 or 18, as she's about to leave her home and go to war, to the front, to active combat. Uh, a very interesting composition here. The girl is looking at herself in the mirror and we can see the reflection behind her of a Moscow uh, Moscow buildings, Moscow apartment houses, and the window with the strips of paper uh, stuck to it to prevent the windows from breaking during bombing and shelling. So a typical a symbol of war. Uh, we can talk a lot about this painting, but let's look at some other one, some other uh, paintings by Gelly Korzhev. Another small painting uh, is called Papa, Get Up. Uh, Korzhev dedicated uh, quite a number of his paintings to social problems. And uh, actually uh, in what, some of his writings and uh, there is a wonderful website uh, uh, of the foundation, Gelly Korja Foundation, established by his family, his daughters and his uh, grandson, that have published some of Korja's writings. So in one of his um, writings, uh, he says that uh, realism, he was a believer in realism. He did not like all kinds of modernist and avant-garde abstract and expressionist movements. He was a firm believer in realism, in realist art. Uh, and he said that, yes, all the art should be realist. That's the real art. Uh, and he, he was quite opinionated and that the artist should uh, paint important things. And what is important, he was asking uh, this question from his readers, social problems, the social life of the society. That's what he believed to be the most important thing. And of course, of course, uh, the alcoholism, the, which was on the rise uh, in the late Soviet Union, attracted his attention. So here you can see a drunken father and a girl trying to wake him. Also, we have a selection of uh, still lives in this exhibition. And still lives are some of my favorite paintings of Gelly Korzhev. Uh, they are beautifully executed, uh, wonderful still lives. And also they have, um, they talk, they have uh, uh, a lot of meaning apart from this being just a selection of objects. Uh, Korzhev usually paints very simple things like a neck, old worn boots. Now also uh, he had a number of uh, clayware in his office 
that he would recycle through his still lives. But it's not about the novelty of things that he paints. Uh, it's about the quality of how he presents these objects as glimpses into, again, the life of the people, the life of the common Soviet people around him. Um, these uh, ex uh, still lives also need to be looked at in person just to enjoy his brush strokes, the colors, and, and sometimes his uh, still lives would be quite conceptual. So here you can see the workers' boots and, and necks. There is something a little bit threatening, I believe, in this still life. And uh, it just shows that, uh, you know, the, and there were several still lives along the same lines. And I believe the way I read it, Korshev would uh, sort of put these things together to create a little bit of a threatening uh, still life, a combination of things to show that, yeah, these people, these common people of Russia, they made a revolution. They're quite capable of another one. Beware. These are some serious people. You have to, you cannot just manipulate them. So something like this, uh, uh, this the speech that these objects actually pronounce can, can be very long and we could develop and imagine what these things are saying. But I believe there is something like this going on here, which is quite fascinating uh, to see in Soviet art. Another beautiful uh, still life. And Korshev often, he didn't pay a lot, uh, a lot of attention to backgrounds. So sometimes he would pay, paint these things sort of suspended in the year, in the air. And a fascinating series that we are showing in uh, this exhibition is his Turliki or the mutant series. And it is believed to be a response to the collapse of the Soviet Union and the emergence of the people who began to take advantage, uh, if not just plain uh, outright criminals, uh, but also the corrupted bureaucrats and uh, new, the new rich, the oligarchs who took tremendous advantage of the people and uh, some of them became billionaires overnight. How can you become a billionaire overnight? Most of the time, probably through some illegal and if not uh, criminal ways. So he began to show the um, new life as he saw it, the people uh, that began to create this new regime in the late 1980s and the early 1990s as these monsters. There, this series is fascinating. It's not fully interpreted. It's open to the interpretation. It's quite deep in how Korshev creates these monsters. To me, it also goes back to the tradition of a famous, uh, well-known and wonderful Dutch artist, uh, Hieronymus Bosch, who was a Christian artist, a Christian uh, believer, a part of the Christian church. And he created his paintings with these little monsters that represented evil, the sins and the vices of humanity that would surround a human being. But here in Korshev's paintings, these are these monsters are the humans actually, the mutated, the humans that change to become something inhuman. And another uh, painting, these two paintings, we showed uh, uh, a lot of works from the Turlicky series in our museum and our previous exhibitions, but I believe these two, so this one, it's quite a large painting. We showed it probably once a long time ago. So it's on display uh, again. Uh, and uh, I, 
Welcome and invite everyone to look at this fascinating painting, those who enjoy this kind of art. And this painting, I believe, also probably did not show the last time we showed the Turlicky series. And with this, that's another painting that's on display for the first time. It's unfinished from the 1950s, has not been shown in this museum ever. Uh, and it's uh, called Gorky and Shalapin, two famous historical figures, Maxim uh, Gorky, a Russian and Soviet writer, and Fyodor Shalapin, a famous bass, a famous opera singer. So with this, let me stop sharing my screen and uh, uh, if anyone has questions, uh, we will all be happy to Thanks, Absolute Masha. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. We've had a little bit of discussion uh, while we've while you've been presenting. I think um, one of the main points here that that I come away with that I want to make sure our audience knows that um, you know every new unveiling of an exhibition is a really exciting time and. It's, uh, we are all lucky to witness it in, in as you see, we, we get to see these installations, we get to work with them and watch how the gallery changes. In this, you know, I, I think it's quite notable how each gallery in this spring sort of set of exhibitions gives a completely different feel, don't you think? There's a little bit, there's something for everyone in each of these four galleries, wouldn't you agree, Masha? Yeah, yeah, it's, um... Sometimes I look at the uh, galleries and it seems like the structure is quite rigid, right? There are, it's a former church. There are arches, there are niches, there are these walls that are different from other walls. But it's remarkable how the space, probably because it's so texturized also, it can be turned into something else every time or almost every time we install a show. So really mm -hmm. grateful to the space. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think that you should all know we talk a lot about coming in person and, and that, you know, experiencing art and feeling the energy of these works, being surrounded by them is, of course, a, an am am amazing experience. We do have expanded hours. Um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we offer an extra hour. So 9.15, I guess it's 45 minutes, 9.15 to 10 in the morning on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, we give a little bit of extra time for those in vulnerable populations and there's no stipulation of what that means. So if you wanna come, there are definitely quiet times to come and we're very mindful about safety and space. It's a very, you know, wonderful space to be, you know, with this art and kind of, it feels like kind of a normal experience to come to our museum. A lot of people have said that. That said, I want you all to know that um, we will continue to be offering um, virtual programs with all of these exhibitions and we record them just like this program so that you'll be able to view them later and share them. We want to be accessible both in our galleries and virtually as well. Mark, do you have any uh, comments after well, hearing? I just want to end with saying, you know, mm -hmm. you can tell from Masha's comments, there's a lot to think about uh, in regard to all of these works and all of these exhibitions. And I think that's an important role that the museum plays as a place for quiet contemplation. And perhaps the church setting as this, you know, was formerly the Mayflower Church helps with that. But uh, I urge you to come and spend some peaceful time in contemplation of these works and think about, you know, what these artists are conveying to you. Mm -hmm. And don't forget, there is a fifth gallery, the Timora Shop, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if you've seen some of our emails. If you haven't, uh, we have our store manager is absolutely phenomenal. And uh, she's really been bringing in some gorgeous goods from all over. So we invite you to also come to the shop and you can also enjoy that online. That's shoptimora.org. So you can also become a member of the museum and you get free uh, admission to every exhibition. Um, all of our virtual programs have been free, so you can also feel free to donate through our website or give us a call or send us a check in the mail. We'll take that too. But we appreciate you just being with your, being here with us and sharing. And it's our pleasure and our honor to share this artwork with you and these programs with you. So with that, I think we've reached our, our 12 o'clock hour. Any final comments, Masha? 
Well, I, I just would like to thank everyone who uh, has joined us today uh, in our grand opening. And I hope to see more of you in the museum because this art really, uh, a lot of it needs to be looked at in person. It's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. We'll be sending out an email with the link for this uh, session so that you can share it with your friends and family. We hope to see you soon in our galleries, soon in general. Take care and be safe.